get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's statistics seminar. And this week, our speaker is Dr. Li Ma from Department of Statistical Sciences at Duke University. And Dr. Ma's research interests include nonparametric modeling and inference, multi-scale inference, recursive partitioning, and tree-related models, as well as a variety of statistical modeling of biomedical data sets. So today, Dr. Ma will tell us something about tree boosting for learning probability measures. So please go ahead, Dr. Ma. All right, uh, thank you, Tenno, for the uh, kind introduction, and uh, thanks to uh, Yan for the uh, invitation. Uh, I'm really very delighted to be giving the talk uh, at your uh, uh, department. I really wish to uh, have visited in person, uh, but I still uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to present on Zoom. So, um, so my talk today uh, is gonna be on boosting. But um, as many of you uh, uh, know about, uh, as many of you probably know about boosting, uh, boosting is a very uh, effective tree-based, well, usually tree-based uh, approach for supervised learning problems. Uh, so, uh, however, uh, my talk today is gonna be on unsupervised learning, which is a problem that has, um, I have uh, been working on for a bit until, uh, recent, uh, the last couple of years, I got a brilliant student, Nao Kiyawaya, that we were able to actually um, realize um, uh, this idea that uh, previously I thought it should be possible, but, but uh, just even lacked the technical steps to get there. So um, I, I'll, you know, probably the audience has uh, includes a number of students, so I'll give you a very brief background about uh, tree-based uh, learning methods, mostly in the context of supervised learning, uh, the first 10 slides or so. And then we'll move into uh, unsupervised setting, which is gonna be the new stuff that we'll cover in the talk. Right, so there are um, a number of very well-known tree-based methods for supervised learning, uh, for such as classification, uh, regression. Oh, I have a typo on slide one, regression missing an S. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but um, for example, there are single tree methods like uh, CART, and there's a Bayesian version of it uh, called Bayesian CART, uh, as well as uh, ensemble methods, uh, bagging, random forest, and uh, additive models like uh, boosting. I'll briefly talk about this starting from CART, give you a little motivation of uh, why uh, the other methods were proposed, in particular, uh, how boosting works and uh, how that uh, motivates uh, our work in the unsupervised setting. So, um, so for card for regression is a sim uh, single tree model. So you have some uh, response Y, uh, and then you have some predictors, uh, multiple predictors XI. You model that as a nonlinear regression model with some error uh, that has some distribution, um, right? So uh, the card model basically assumes that the F, the nonlinear uh, mean function, has a uh, piecewise constant structure uh, constructed based on a recursive uh, tree partition. So this is one example where uh, the space of Y, uh, sorry, the space of X is divided into four pieces, each of them corresponding to a constant value of Y, uh, the, the uh, constant value of mean for Y. Right. So. Um, so I'm, uh, the, I'm gonna use this capital R to denote this uh, recursive partition that's create, uh, constructed on the predictive space and gamma to uh, be the mean parameter, uh, constant parameter associated with each of the block, right? Now, uh, usually these models are fit by uh, usually some kind of, in a frequent context, uh, using some greedy algorithm to learn the partition. And then given the partition, uh, fit gamma that minimizes some loss function, right? And then you use the fitted value uh, for the mean as your predictor, uh, given uh, any new um, predictor value. Right? So there's a Bayesian version of it, which kind of puts priors on the nonlinear function. Uh, in particular, you need to put priors on the partition tree, as well as the um, um, the mean function should be gamma, not mu, sorry, another typo, right? Uh, so uh, 
of course, you also uh, need priors on the uh, variance of the error, usually if you have a Gaussian uh, error model, for example. But I'm uh, uh, abbreviating the notation, just emphasizing the prior specification on the tree part, the, the mean part, right? And then you uh, do Bayes theorem and uh, get this posterior and try to sample from the posterior of the uh, function f given a set of data points, right? Usually, uh, Gibbs sampling is used in the classical uh, Bayesian card models. Gibbs sampling is used. Uh, of course, uh, many of us who worked with uh, MCMC on tree spaces because it's so uh, large, the space is so large and multimodal, generally speaking, you won't hope uh, your algorithm to very um, effectively explore the massive tree space. Uh, you're just hoping that they are covering a range of meaningful uh, models. So, Sometimes we refer to that as a strategy of stochastic search rather than you know, uh, being very confident in that our sampling algorithm is exploring uh, all of the uh, good portions of the model space. So let me move on. So there are some pros and cons uh, for both, um, uh, for CARD, either frequentist or Bayesian, but let me just talk about the frequentist in particular uh, version. In particular, it's very simple and fast. Very easy to interpret. Doctors love this. You have, you know, kind of a dyadic uh, tree partition where you can associate uh, health outcomes, for example, for different uh, categories of uh, patients who fall into different partition blocks, right? The cause is that the, the predictive performance is usually very lousy um, and, uh, and it's very prone to overfit. Um, the model, if the, you allow the tree to be very large, Generally speaking, the bias isn't huge, uh, but, uh, but generally speaking, these models have um, an issue of high variance. Uh, it's very easy to overfit. And uh, as a result, uh, over, uh, as a result, uh, out of sample, our uh, predictive performance is generally not great. So uh, because of these limitations, uh, there were a couple of ensemble methods uh, proposed generally um, uh, with the idea of somehow reducing the variance of uh, the, uh, the card model, right? So I made a brief comment about Bayesian card, although it might get, give you a little bit better predictive performance than the frequentist card, uh, the, the, the same um, issue of, uh, that I mentioned is still uh, is there. And also generally because you're sampling a bunch of trees, uh, you lose a little bit of the interpretability that a single uh, greedy tree uh, provides to a doctor, for example. Of course, you can come up with, based on the uh, stochastic search, you can alleviate that problem by finding some representative tree structure that can also be interpreted. So the second point is uh, somewhat addressable. Uh, the the uh, overfitting issue, high variance issue uh, is still there. So um, the uh, one of the most simple idea of uh, variance reduction is bagging. Um, basically, the idea is to just resample your original data uh, by bootstrap, and every time you uh, refit your card model, and after the refitting, you get a, a prediction for each bootstrap data set and average that uh, to get your prediction. All right. Now, um, the idea is to hope um, is hopefully uh, you will reduce the variability. The issue, though, is that because uh, let's say frequent this card. Um, uses often a um, very greedy algorithm to find the tree. Uh, under, under this uh, resampled data sets, uh, the, the, the fitted tree model generally is highly correlated. So the tree can be very similar to each other. Uh, and therefore, you don't actually have ID uh, samples of the trees from, from, uh, from some space. Rather, they are highly correlated. And therefore, when you, uh, when you take the average of highly correlated objects, uh, you don't uh, uh, reduce the variance that, that much, right, sometimes. And therefore, um, there's this new, another idea uh, which aims at improving bagging by decorrelate these uh, card trees fitted on bootstrap data set. Uh, the idea of random forest, which is basically uh, try to force the trees being fit to each of the bootstrap data set to be more dissimilar to each other so that uh, they're not as highly correlated to each other uh, with the hope of more effective uh, variance reduction, which is generally very effective. In many 
uh, data sets, random, uh, random forest is a very powerful uh, predict, uh, predictor, uh, pr predictive method, right? So the idea of random forest is to um, force the trees to be different. And therefore, uh, at each tree split, the random forest will actually randomly choose a subset of uh, all the predictors. Uh, let's say a third of all the predictors, among which you um, use a greedy algorithm to choose uh, to choose the next split. Because of this random selection of subset of the predictors, that forces your uh, tree construction to be more different every time you you choose a split, uh, which forces the tree that you construct on the bootstrap data sets to be more uh, less similar. Right. So the performance is generally for random forest is generally substantially better than card and bagging. So random forest is a very popular uh, supervised learning tool. Right, so um, now of course there, are, it's, it's not a cure all. Uh, sometimes uh, in the some situations, random forest can uh, perform lousily. In particular, you can imagine a, a simple scenario where, for example, although you have a huge number of predictors, only a small subset are really uh, relevant and, and, and useful for making a prediction, then the random selection of predictors are probably going to miss most of the relevant predictors. And in those situations, uh, the vanilla version of the random forest isn't going to do very well. Right. So um, now, the idea of uh, bagging and random forest, oh, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Uh, and I'm, I'm not monitoring the hand raising function. So, so um, the if you, you could just uh, shout out, or you can raise your hand. I will try to monitor that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, the idea of bagging and uh, random forest is basically uh, variance reduction. They utilize uh, essentially model averaging of strong learners, right? So the bag, each cut tree could be pretty complex. Strong meaning that it, it's the structure is pretty flexible to uh, pretty real. Uh, I mean, to flexibly characterize the online. Uh, mean function. The issue of card, of course, is large variance, and therefore, by this model averaging idea, uh, you're trying to reduce that variability. It's um, right. So um, it, the, the, neither of, uh, neither bagging nor random forest tries to address uh, the bias part um, of of the card model. It's purely <laughs> operating on uh, the variance proportion, right? So. Uh, there's a different idea, boosting, um, which is also an ensemble method based on the tree, uh, uh, tree models, but the idea is actually quite, quite different. It's not trying to reduce variance, but rather it's trying to reduce bias. It starts off with a bunch of so-called weak learners, usually also, uh, usually also tree-based models. Uh, I'll talk about uh, you know, what, what's, uh, what is a weak learner. The weak learner means that each learner is forced to be pretty simple, and therefore they are not very flexible in characterizing complex uh, mean structures, and therefore they, each learner generally uh, induces a large bias. However, they generally have low, low variance, and the idea is to build an additive model uh, by adding up uh, a collection of weak learners so that you are able to uh, aggregately um, uh, give you very flexible modeling of the mean function uh, while maintaining a low variance. So uh, in the context of tree models, weak weakness of a learner can be enforced by, for example, either limiting the size of each tree that you can construct. And then secondly, we'll talk about that more, is that once you fit a uh, tree-based uh, uh, learner, you can also shrink it towards zero by reducing the magnitude of, of the mean function under that model. So uh, that's pretty much, uh, well, so, uh, okay, there's one more slide on that. So for boosting, uh, un unlike random forest and uh, bagging, it actually modifies the model form, right? So the mean function f, oh, sorry, uh, this is a typo, there's an epsilon i I missed, right? So the mean function f is actually written as the sum of a bunch of uh, weak models, G, uh, gk, each of which can be a piecewise constant function come out of a uh, recursive partition structure, right? So you actually modify the, the, the function of the mean uh, into an additive model involving a bunch of base learners, right? So 
Um, and then the question is how you fit uh, such a model, right? So, so you restrict each of the GK to be a weak learner by making it simple and perhaps also do some shrinkage, usually also do some shrinkage. So, um, and of course, if you have a bunch of weak learners in order to make their sum flexible, you generally need a fairly large number of uh, weak learners to be added together. So the capital K uh, is usually in the hundreds or more, right? So um, generally how you fit it, you, uh, you know, ideally the idealistic situation is that you come up with some loss function and then try to uh, fit this additive model by, uh, minimizing over the space of those uh, base learners, capital K here, uh, that minimizes that loss, right? Now, of course, that problem, if you have a large number of K and everything, so on, generally speaking, this problem, uh, this problem is not uh, tractable, right? So there's a very popular strategy that gives you somewhat of an approximation to the to this loss minimization strategy is called forward stage-wise fitting. Or for, uh, in a uh, well-known textbook ESL, it's called forward stage-wise modeling, but I would like to call it fitting because it's kind of more uh, on the decision theoretic aspect than the model itself, All right? So, uh, so basically it's a, a kind of a greedy fitting uh, one step at a time, one piece at a time strategy. So you fit, uh, one G small K at, uh, at a time, rather than fitting all of them jointly by minimizing the loss. So basically uh, you start off from G1 and let's say that uh, up to the, at the K step, you already fitted all the previous Gs. Now to get the next G, GK, you just minimize the loss over the N observations um, by minimizing over that single, let's say tree model uh, uh, by adding the, uh, where f hat is the fitted mean to the uh, previous uh, k minus one weak learners, basically the sum of the previous k minus one uh, base learners. <coughs> then, uh, sorry, question? Or, okay, no, sorry. Um, so, um, so, and at, at, after the k step, you just update your uh, current mean fit by adding the uh, uh, fit in the current step, right? So, with square loss and some other loss, but in particular square loss, let's say in the regression setting, you use square loss, then this uh, forward stage-wise uh, fitting is particularly simple because you could, uh, at every step, you could just replace the yi, sorry, yi here uh, with the current residual for each of the observation, and then you can ignore the f hat here now, right? You just fit the g to the current residuals, right? So uh, the uh, kind of general algorithm for uh, the regression setting with square loss uh, under the forward stage-wise fitting is basically in each step K, you fit this one additional base learner by uh, minimizing the square loss uh, with respect to the current set of residuals. And then you get the current fit and then you just update the residual and then repeat to the, um, uh, this, this algorithm, uh, the, the repeat uh, to the next K until you exhaust the capital K number of number of ba uh, base learners, right? Now, of course, you can also incorporate shrinkage. Uh, you can multiply the fitted uh, GK by a constant between zero and one, usually pretty small, like 0 0.01, 0 0.01, uh, so that uh, every time you only modify the mean function by a little bit to avoid overfit, right? We do uh, to avoid overfit, right? So, uh, and finally, at the end of the day, you predict uh, by the uh, sum of all the predictions over the K steps. Right, so uh, of course, there's also a Bayesian version of this uh, called uh, BART. Uh, basically, the idea uh, is to put priors on uh, each of the, sorry, I should have used uh, G, G1, G2, GK. I have some typos, but this is a fresh talk. So uh, I haven't given us uh, either a seminar or conference talk on this before. So I uh, apologize, you, you, you get my first version, right? So uh, I did, um, have a summer school that covered some of the material, but, but basically this is the first time I gave a seminar talk on this. Right. So, uh, so th this is um, the the um, the G version. Uh, sorry, G one, G two up to G K. You just put a prior on that, and then uh, usually independent priors like the individual cut priors, and then you try to sample from the posterior. Right. So um, 
again by base uh, by gap sampling again the, now the model space is even larger than a single tree so you, you won't hope it, hope the gap sampler to actually uh, converge to some stationary uh, stationary distribution that covers the entire model space you're just hoping that it uh, kind of uh, wanders around in a good portion of the model space uh, if your goal is just to do prediction then perhaps uh, that's fine uh, by averaging the prediction over your uh, the, the uh, collection of models your chain is is uh, is uh, moving over right again I'm being a little uh, sloppy here I did not include the prior on the variance of the error of course you need that as well but I'm skipping that emphasizing the tree part right so um, so the the algorithm is not um, uh, not forward forward stage wise fitting but uh it's called back fitting because uh because of the nature of uh here the mcmc algorithm uh you you not you don't run through these capital k models just once you actually loop through them every time you sample from the uh full conditional of one of these models given everything else and so you you will revisit uh, every of these uh, models multiple times, and that, that's why it's called backfitting, not for stage wise fitting. Right? There's a backfitting algorithm in the frequentist context as well. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that. Now, finally, I'm going to get into the new stuff, the the, uh, the the interesting stuff for the talk. So, uh, for details, you can read the bot paper. Very nice, uh, very very popular, very powerful method. So, for the last, uh, actually, ever since my PhD days, I been working with biological data set, which uh, like full cytometry or something like that. Uh, those are often the problem is unsupervised. You get uh, multivariate measurements from oftentimes pretty high dimensional distribution, like 50, 100 dimensions. And you get a bunch of IID data. And uh, um, the interest, the core problem in unsupervised learning is to learn about the underlying distribution. Uh, either, you know, density estimation is one example, but there are also other uh, tasks in learning structures about the probability distribution. Now you're given, let's say, an ID data set from, from some unknown distribution. Somehow, I have the feeling that the, um, the additive modeling strategy should be able to address cost of dimensionality here as well. Uh, if it's able to address the flexibility in the mean structure in the regression setting, it should somehow be able to also work uh, to characterize flexible, let's say, density function. Uh, but how do we do that? How do we how do we uh, go from a supervised um, approach, in particular boosting, uh, to uh, an unsupervised boosting um, approach? Right. So there are a lot of uh, density estimate methods, both frequentist and Bayesian, for low dimensional problems. In particular, uh, starting from my PhD days all the way until you know even even now, I wouldn't say until. I mean this is still ongoing work. Uh, is um, a, 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 a big chunk of my time is spent on um, uh, constructing tree-based, single tree-based models for um, estimating uh, distribution de uh, density, uh, densities and uh, distribution features. In particular, um, you know, uh, a class of work which is can be thought of as a Bayesian counterpart. Uh, sorry, uh, um, a density estimation counterpart for uh, for uh, for cart model is called polytree-based methods. So. So this is the unsupervised counterpart for the COD model under the supervised setting. So I've, uh, I've, I've been spending uh, a lot of time with uh, very uh, multiple students uh, in the past few years, building, uh, trying to build good single tree learners for densities. But then they suffered similar situations, similar uh, similar difficulties as CART in high dimensional regressions. So the question is, can the ensemble approach uh, for cards that uh, overcomes curse of dimensionality really well in high dimensional settings be adopted in the super, uh, unsupervised setting, perhaps on these polyetry based models uh, to address uh, curse of dimensionality. Right, so uh, we all know that uh, learning densities and high dimensional uh, distributions is very, very challenging uh, because the data is very sparse in a high dimensional space, right? Uh, and you, you, it's very easy to overfit, uh, but not careful, right? So um, the idea is that uh, for this talk is that, well, we try to represent the unknown true probability measure as an additive model, additive model, because it's not immediately clear what addition means, because you cannot add, let's say, probability measure 
multiple power lead measures to get another power lead measure because they're not the sum of two power lead uh, measure is not a power lead measure anymore. And the sum of two density functions is not a density. So we have to have a notion of additivity that has some nice properties, right? So what nice properties do we need to have, right? So um, in particular, in fitting a supervised boosting, there's an operation called residual, re residualization, which is we need to subtract um, probability, a fitted probability measure from a set of observations to get the current residuals. So this is, I, I want to emphasize, this is not subtraction of a probability measure from a probability measure. This is subtraction of a probability measure uh, to, from a, an observation so that the residual observation uh, contains information uh, in the original data that excludes the, this fit, fitted measure. So, uh, so we need to define notions of uh, addition on um, probability distributions that gives you natural ways of um, residualization in some way. Right? So suppose we're able to design such an addition and residualization. The, the vision of a four stage-wise fitting algorithm, for example, in this context would be something like this. Starting off with the ba uh, baseline uh, without any fit, uh, starting off with zero. So what's the zero measure here, <laughs> right? That's also a question to address. We iterate from K uh, equals one to capital K. And then we also need to specify some loss function. And in each iteration, uh, we are doing this uh, forward stage wise fitting. So we're just fitting the next uh, component in the additive model to the current residuals according to this loss, summing over the n id observations, right? And then once we can do that fit, we just add it to the current fit, and then we take residualization, get the residual for the next round of fit, right? So that's the idea. The question is, what are the summation and the residualization <laughs> that will make this work and justifies this uh, algorithm, right? So that's the key. Now, of course, at the end of the day, if you want density, you also need a computationally effective way of taking derivatives of that fitted measure. And is it possible that uh, this computation can be very easy to carry out? So there are a number of questions. So what is the corresponding addition? What is the corresponding residualization? What is corresponding zero? And what is the corresponding loss function, right? So uh, the zero perhaps is the easiest to guess. I, I, Maybe someone in the audience can tell me, what would you guess to be the zero measure? <laughs> well, the uniform, right? <laughs> so that's the easiest to guess because it, it's something that doesn't have structure, but everything else is less trivial. So, um, so let's, uh, it turns out that the solution is very surprisingly simple. And, and, uh, and this is due to my student Naoki. And it's very surprisingly simple. I start off with an observation. So if I give you a measure G, and if I tell you that X is a draw from G, then we know that um, if I use the capital G to denote the CDF of G, that's for simplicity for now, let's just think about continuous uh, uh, random variables, right? Then I apply the CDF transform to that random variable, I get a uniform. And think of the uniform as our zero here. In other words, it seems that applying the CDF transform corresponding to some distribution does the trick of subtracting that distribution to that from that observation and get you a residual that does not have the structure of that distribution anymore, right? So this, this is a big hint. In other words, somehow applying CDF transform of a data set uh, flattens the data set to something more uniform. If you apply a G that's exactly um, uh, the, the right uh, the true uh, CDF, then it's going to give you exactly ID sample from the zero distribution, the uniform distribution. So, so okay, this is this is very helpful. So, how do we use that? So, we seem to have an idea of how do we do residualization now. But what is the corresponding addition that uh, are consistent with this? That, uh, that's consistent with this residualization operation. It turns out that the solution is also simple. So what do I mean by being consistent? Being consistent meaning that if I have an X observation that's distributed from the sum of G plus H, I haven't told you how we define the sum, then if I take the residual of G 
uh, x from uh, by subtracting g, then they should distri be distributed as h. In other words, if I apply the um, CDF transform of g on x, then the residual, the remaining uh, distribution should be h, right? So how do we design? So this gives us the clue as to how to design the addition. It turns out that all we need to do is to design addition by compositions of CDFs because there's a nice uh, property of CDFs which says that if X is distributed uh, as a function with this particular uh, sequence of composition of CDF, then if we apply G to X, it will have a CDF of H. So in other words, um, the addition, the appropriate addition is a uh, is composition of two CDFs. So it turns out the solution is very simple. And uh, the additive model of a bunch of uh, uh, probability measures just corresponds to that measure whose CDF is the sequence of uh, composition of these CDFs, and that's it. So in the Wendy case, now this only addressed the problem in the Wendy case. The interesting case is the multivariate case, right? So in the Wendy case, with this, we can now plug in the notion of addition, residualization, and zero into our uh, forward stage-wise uh, the boosting algorithm. So starting with the uniform, right? And then the loss I haven't covered. It turns out that the loss is just the log likelihood. But uh, I'll justify that later, give you a little theory. But, but it turns out that the appropriate loss is the log likelihood, the, the join, uh, the log density of, of the, uh, the, the unknown uh, at the current fit, G. And uh, in each step, you just update it by this CDF composition, and then take the residual by uh, applying CDF trans, uh, transform to the current residual. Right, and then it turns out, <laughs> this is a, a quite amazing to me when I first found out, is that if I want to get the log likelihood, uh, sorry, the log fitted, uh, fitted density, well, um, if the sum of the distribution are defined by CDF compositions, if you take the derivative with respect to the base measure by chain rule, the composition becomes a sequence of products, products of the densities. Correspondingly, if you take the log, the fitted density can be updated up uh, again very easily, just adding the current log fit density to the previous round, and you get always the current fit of the log density. So you avoid it completely, the integration, which is um, very, uh, very, uh, very computationally uh, demanding, and all the updates are very simple to compute. Right? Now, of course, one D case is not interesting. We need to do this in multivariate settings, but uh, let's generalize this strategy to multivariate settings. But it's not going to work if we use CDF. Why is that? Because the traditional notion of CDF is not um, is not a good definition. <laughs> the reason why I say it's not a good definition is because it's not a bijection. It match um, it, it it maps a d-dimensional sample space to the unit interval, right? So you cannot. It's not invertible. <laughs> It's not a one-to-one -one map. And moreover, it loses structure because when you apply a CDF to a D-dimensional object, you get something that's one-dimensional. So you cannot use that to do residualization. You start off with a 10-dimensional observation. You apply, you subtract G using this CDF, you end up with a one-dimensional object. That's not a 10-dimensional observation anymore. So you lose structure. So residualization is also not possible. So we felt that the definition of tradi traditional notions of CDF is lacking in some sense. It kind of loses structure and, it, and the mapping is not invertible. It, 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 you're losing information about the distribution somehow, somehow, right? So a new definition of CDFs that are preserving the necessary properties of univariate CDFs is, is necessary. So we need to invent one of that. So let's think about how do we do that? Um, it turns out that we can uh, define a multivariate CDF by um, a different perspective on the univariate CDF. So think of the CDF not as the integral of a uh, density function, which is how we usually taught basic statistics, right? but rather think of CDF as a transform on the data and think of what a CDF does to the data and try to gener uh, gen uh, generalize that operation on the data to the multivariate situation. Right, so I'll get into that in a minute. But generally speaking, we need some general properties of this uh, generalized notion of CDF. One is that first of all, it has to preserve 
the dimensionality of the sample space so that you can subtract a distribution but maintaining the uh, original structure of the data so uh, in order to form your residual and then also you it needs to have this basic property which is the flattening property the residualization property you should be able to subtract the uh the information of the distribution in g by applying that generalized notion of cdf multivariate cdf to end up with a zero here now is the univariate uh, sorry the multivariate uniform and then again it will also has to uh, have to satisfy properties like uh if x is g plus some h where it's defined to be uh, the 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 cdf of this distribution is the uh, composition of the generalized notion of cdf the x minus g should be distributed as h right so these properties are what's um, motivating us in uh, forming this idea of addition and residualization and needs to be preserved and of course uh, g should be uniquely determined by uh, this uh, generalized uh, uh, notion of cdf which the, the last one is also satisfied by the univariate uh, C, uh, the traditional uh, multivariate CDF, but the first two is not. Um, so uh, we want to construct a, we think, uh, more, um, more useful notion of CDF that preserves all these uh, properties. So let's, again, go back to what I just said. Let's try to understand what a CDF does to a data point. So let's draw a plot. So just for simplicity, let's say that it's between uh, the sample spaces between zero and one. And you have, let me make a big plot. <laughs> let me be ambitious here. Let me make a big plot. Let's say that you have a CDF that looks like that, right? It goes from, let's say the sample space is zero one one for simplicity, right? A CDF is like that, right? It goes from zero to one, right? Now uh, let's think of uh, what it does to a data point. So in a one dimensional case, okay? So if I have a data point here, Applying the CDF is going to map it to here. Now let's draw the 45 degree line. Right, let me use a different color. Right. So let me use a different color. Uh, green. So this is the 45 degree line. Right. So what um, the CDF transform does is that this flattening operation which moves in an original uh, data point cross to this real circle, right? So it does the flattening because it kind of pushes the uh, observation toward, uh, I'm gonna use a very vague form, uh, because of the fact that the, uh, the CDF um, is in this case concave, meaning that the probability potential is higher on the left side in general, it pushes the data point toward lower, lower uh, probability mass, uh, in the lower probability mass direction. Right. So if you think of a probability, uh, a CDF transform as uh, this operation that pushes the data point from across to the uh, circle, then it turns out that we could do this through multiple steps. We don't have to apply uh, this uh, operation just in one step. What we could do is this. We can come up with a sequential approximation to this CDF. In other words, in the first stage, I approximate this CDF using a piecewise, uh, two piecewise linear functions. And uh, in, under this approximation, this point is going to be moved toward a intermediary point, which is triangle. And then on the next day, stage, I will again get another piecewise addition to that CDF, which will push this point, um, in this case, toward the uh, right again, right? So you can continue this strategy until this piecewise uh, linear approximation to the CEF gets more and more precise. Eventually, you're going to get at this red circle. Okay, so that's the idea. So in other words, what does this mean? Is that you can write the univariate, uh, univariate CDF as a sequence of compositions of CDFs, where each of the CDF is the CDF of the corresponding piecewise constant, dyadic piecewise constant. In the corresponding branch of partitions, you can give me any sequence of dyadic partitions. Uh, you give me a point cross that starts from here. I can always find the sequence of partition blocks that contains this point. And then I can just from bottom to top, 
move the point according to the CDF uh, corresponding to that uh, local piecewise dyadic, uh, dyadic function, dyadic constant function, right? And then you can uh, write the sequence of composition eventually move you to the circle that I drew. Okay, so now why do I draw this plot? Because now this is completely generalizable to a uh, multivariate sample space now, because a multivariate sample space also can be partitioned into a dyadic sequ sequence of dyadic partitions, except that every time you divide, there might be a different direction in the partition, but you can still build this tree. And then you can just define a multivariate uh, CDF as the sequence of composition of univariate uh, CDFs, where the operation is still moving from the high probability potential region to the toward the low probability potential region. The only difference is that every time corresponding to the direct uh, dimension you are dividing, the direction of the operation is changing. Okay, so this is this is the notion of the tree CDF. Tree CDF because you have to give me a dyadic uh, piecewise uh, sorry a dyadic recursive partition tree on spaces. Right, so I'm gonna skip that. Right, so um. This is the tree CDF. I'll give you a diagram. So let's say that we have this multivariate uh, sample space. Uh, the operation of applying this guy uh, is basically sequentially in the first level move according in this direction because this variable is partitioned from the high probability region toward the low probability region. And then uh, on this next level, uh, because this variable is partitioned again, um, again moving along that direction, but now in the low uh, probability direction, which is now. Uh, this opposite direction and then finally uh, on the top level this partition is another variable so now the uh, moving of the point on the top level is a different um, uh, is perpendicular to the original direction but again from the high poverty region toward the low poverty region it turns out that you, you will have roughly five minutes left uh, okay all right so um thanks for the reminder yeah um so so this uh, you can show that all the key properties are maintained. And in fact, uh, a, a consequence of this subtraction of X giving you a uniform allows you to actually have an inverse CDF sampler <laughs> to allow you to do Monte Carlo on multivariate distributions. So that, that, that's even, that's a very nice byproduct, which I will show you an example if I have a few seconds on that. So, and also uniquely determines G. So now we have all the pieces. We have our four stage wide algorithm. Starting from the uniform, multivariate uniform, uh, we have the loss function, and then we can just do our four stage wide fit. Every, every time we just apply the corresponding tree CDF, uh, the generalized multivariate CDF on the current residuals, and then the fit density is updated additively to the current round of residuals. I'll give you a, a cartoon of uh, animation of this flattening, sequential flattening of this uh, through this uh, forward stage right algorithm. So every time you fit a new GK, you're flattening the data a little bit. You start off from this highly non-uniform sample, you eventually get to the uniform sample. So every time you extract a little bit of the information from the uh, multivariate distribution until you essentially get back a uh, ID sample from the uniform distribution. Okay. So I have only three or four minutes left. So I will give you a little theory. Uh, so I haven't told you why we chose the uh, loss function to be the log likelihood, right? So let me tell you that now. So the question is, what's the appropriate loss function that the four stage-wise fit give you a uh, approximation to the optimization uh, strategy uh, solution that I, uh, that I wrote here? Right here, of course, in our problem, these are the XIs. In a supervised learning problem, you have XI and uh, GK XI. But here we have just X, uh, the, the uh, XI and the, uh, the GKs without the X on the, on the second argument, right? So the loss function is actually just the covariate divergence. So if the truth is F star, F is a fit, the covariate libular divergence is a natural uh, distance measure. And we can call it the entropy loss. Right? And it turns out that you can write the entropy loss uh, for any additive model uh, under our notion of addition. Uh, you can write it as um, basically the first term is a constant. The second term can be written as the sum of K 
k contributions, each from uh, one of the fit for the gk, which we call the improvements. So fitting gk, so the fk tilde is the distribution of the k step residual. So basically, you can uh, think of the um, Povelab divergence, the entropy loss, uh, as the sum of k components where uh, each is contributed from the uh, small case component gk in fitting the uh, current residual. Current residual meaning that uh, if you apply the previous k minus one CDFs, three CDFs to an observation from f star, uh, the distribution of this residual is f case uh, tilde, right? So in other words, uh, you're, in every step of your fitting, uh, in a forward stage-wise fitting, you're essentially trying to fit GK to uh, maximize this improvement, right? Uh, there's a finite, there's a finite uh, sample version of this covalabular divergence, right? You notice that the, this is the population version. The population version involves this integration, which is just the expectation of the log of uh, log, dens uh, log density under the fit. But uh, an empirical version is just uh, negative log likelihood. Okay, that's why in the algorithm, we end up using the um, the, the negative uh, log likelihood. And it turns out that there's a finite sample version of the uh, decomposition of the entropy loss, which corresponds to a finite version of the improvements, uh, which the forward stage-wide algorithm is essentially uh, trying to greedily maximize uh, um, so over. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping that. So for the theory, for the details, you can look at the paper. So I'm going to make a comment about um, uh, the, um, the base learner, uh, cho choice of the base learner. You can use greedy learners, but but uh, but, we're, uh, but we use a uh, model which is the Bayesian version of the um, Cart model in the setting of uh, uh, density estimation, which uh, we can show that actually um, is not greedy, and when sample size is large, approximates the optimal uh, solution to the uh, optimization on the improvement. Okay, I'm gonna skip that, and then we can incorporate shrinkage by taking an average of fit every step. Probably I shouldn't use the tilt because I already used tilt for something else. So I should change that. But you can shrink it toward the uniform value. Okay. I'll just very quickly show you a couple of um, um, numerical examples and I'll stop in a minute. So this, these are 48 degree uh, dimensional uh, data sets. I picked some examples that are far from piecewise constant. So these are the most difficult situations for single tree models, right? So, and uh, and you can look at the uh, log uh, predicted density, out of sample predict, uh, predicted density uh, for different learning rate. The three different curves are the different learning rates. And you realize that shrinkage is really important if you have high learning rate like the black curve. Uh, the, oh, sorry, high learning rate like the dash uh, blue curve. Uh, eventually, it will decay uh, uh, very quickly. The proofs can decay very quickly. So I'm going to skip that. And then uh, you can, uh, basically all the lessons we learned in the supervised setting uh, is maintained here. You need uh, some simple tree to approximate very flexible mean functions. I'm gonna skip the last part, which is the illustration of the inverse CEF sampler, which will allow you to do Monte Carlo um, uh, based on this generalized notion of CDFs on multivariate distribution in particular for tree-based model methods. So I'll stop with the acknowledgement of my uh, student, Melki. Uh, who made, made the most contribution to this work. Uh, and uh, there's the funding agencies, NSF and the Nakajima Foundation that provided Naoki with a fellowship. Uh, the paper is on archive and the software is also on GitHub. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Ma for a nice talk. And I guess we will have time for say maybe one or two quick questions. Anybody want to ask a question? Please just unmute yourself. Um, hello, uh, nice talk. Uh, so uh, I have a question about like this multivariate transformations. Uh, so uh, there is uh, something called Boson batch transformations they date back to 1952, right? So uh, the idea is very simple, S very similar indeed. Like uh, it's using conditional density. Uh, it's also a sequence of like composition no transformations that will give you all these uh, inverse CD, inverse uh, uniform properties. Uh, how does it relate mm -hmm. to uh, what you have uh, yeah. been presented? Yeah. Yeah. What Thanks. I want to say is that our, uh, our definition of distribution does not use conditional density. Um, okay. So it, it does not 
try to uh, decompose um, the F into components based on a sequence of conditional probability. No, each of the, the piece is separate from each other. Um, they are aggregated through this, um, the, this uh, notion of uh, CDF composition, basically. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So we, we did not touch the conditional structure in those probability measures at all. Yeah. So so, so uh, I guess like then in this case like uh, you will get computational gain. Uh, is that the case? Uh, I, 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 sorry. Uh, do you, so uh, I guess like uh, not expo not using the conditional yeah. density you will get computational yeah, yeah, yeah. gain. Right? So okay. I made a comment earlier. So the I think computationally uh, this is very efficient and the most computational challenge comes from the need to do integration. Okay. If you have to compute conditional probability, meaning that you have to divide out some marginal probability, you have to do integration. And integration is not doable in high dimensional okay. space. So you have to have a way of avoiding integration. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to ask for another quick question? Okay, if no, then let's thank Dr. Ma again for the very nice talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. Um, Bye. Bye-bye.